Josh is going to talk about some of the highlights of, of his book, which is uh, an incredibly good read. And uh, it's called The Hunt for KSM, for people watching on C-SPAN who want to go and buy it right now, please. Uh, and uh, over, over to you, Josh. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, Peter and I actually go way back to, um, I don't know if we met before 9-11, but uh, we're two of the reporters who were writing about it, I guess, before it was fashionable. I remember back then it was a whole different landscape. Uh, it was a lot easier to talk to some people uh, about this. There were people that were very concerned about it. Maybe it was harder to talk to some other people, but I remember that uh, before 9-11, uh, for instance, I was only allowed to use one Abu per story because my editors <laughs> thought that thought that it would be too confusing. Um, it was actually hard to get some of the stories on the front page. Uh, I remember doing one in the summer of 2001 about how Al-Qaeda had uh, changed its focus and appeared to be intent on attacking inside the United States now instead of targets overseas. And uh, my editors, who hopefully won't be listening to this, didn't uh, want to put it on the front page, so I had to call the managing editor. We finally got it on the front page, and 9-11 happened uh, um, 10, 11 weeks later. Um, so ever since then, I've been following Al-Qaeda and, and, and terrorism, much as Peter has. Um, and starting in 2002, I got a tip. We, we mentioned this in the prologue of the book, that I was in a bar in uh, New York City, uh, talking to a bunch of agents who were from the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force there, and uh, in comes the Pent Bomb Squad, which was the, the investigators for the actual 9-11 plot. And so after talking for hours about everything but terrorism because they couldn't talk about the investigation, I said, you know, give me a tip, give me a, something to go on, a lead, a name. And one of them looked around and said sort of in a stage whisper, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. I wrote it on a cocktail napkin and started making calls the next day. Um, and the reason I mention that is because, you know, writing about al-Qaeda and, and Osama bin Laden, um, Peter's book, I can't wait to read, which is coming out, uh, Ayman Zawahiri, all the others, KSM to me always um, stood out as somebody that was much different than the others. He just seemed much more politically oriented. He, he just seemed to have a sense of humor. He just seemed like he liked to have a good time. He was just much more fascinating. And while bin Laden and Zawahiri and many of the others stayed in their compound in Afghanistan, uh, KSM was the one who really was traveling around the world, uh, getting things done, doing things, um, and and it just really fascinated me because even, I think it was almost exactly 18 months after 9-11 when he was finally brought to ground. So, you know, I just started thinking in 2002, you know, how did he get away with it for so long and what was he doing all that time? Uh, and even more importantly, who was, who, if anybody, was chasing him and what were they doing to try to catch him before 9-11. So that was the genesis of the book, and, and I teamed up with my um, co-writer at the LA Times, um, Terry McDermott, to, to do a very long profile of KSM back in 2002. Um, we were fortunate enough back then, uh, this is before he was caught, obviously, to, uh, to speak to people um, who were involved in the chase, to talk to ISI frontline officials and people at the top, top levels of the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, uh, to try to get a sense of what was happening. And, and I've been following the case on and off ever since. So to talk about the book, um, you know, some of the things that we touch on in the book are uh, how officials at the FBI and the Department of Justice in the years before 9-11 um, actually undermined uh, the protracted, uh, protracted global hunt for KSM, in part because it was too expensive. Uh, there was a group of very dedicated off, uh, officers, agents uh, of the FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York who literally chased KSM around the world starting in 1993 after they, they identified him as one of the uh, financiers of the first World Trade Center attacks. And that quickly led to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the uncle of uh, Abdul Basid al-Karim, otherwise known as Ramzi Youssef. Uh, and they started chasing him then. They followed him to the Philippines, to Malaysia, to... Uh, uh, to Qatar, where they almost caught KSM in 1996. Um, they kept chasing it, but somehow or other in the late 90s, he disappeared, went into Afghanistan. And, and one of the big um, failures to connect the dots um, in the 9-11 attacks, which I think we try to articulate in the book, um, is how did they not make the connection that KSM uh, was part of Al-Qaeda? And, and Ali Sufan, I know, was here speaking in this forum, and he was one of the people that that said we, we had no idea that uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was part of al-Qaeda until uh, March or April of 2002 when they caught Abu Zubaydah in Pakistan and he almost by chance 
literally by chance, identified him as Mukhtar, who was a guy they were looking for. But so we tried to go back and, and tell this as a story. I mean, I, like Peter um, and others in the audience, have read so many books on terrorism, uh, having covered it as a beat, that the one thing uh, we didn't want to do was um, foist on the public another uh, tome, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to discredit or, uh, or criticize the others. They're very important books, but we wanted to just tell a story about the hunt for KSM, the people chasing him. And, and it wasn't an unintended consequence, but it was through the investigation of that that we really were able to, I think, tell also the story of how 9-11 came to be and how people missed, missed it and how they missed the attack. And one of the ways they did that was the FBI people that were chasing KSM in the, in the late 90s um, really got um, sideways with their bosses because they were focusing on what was seen to be a cold case, an isolated case uh, connected to some terrorist plots in, in Malaysia, uh, excuse me, in Manila, uh, the Philippines in, in the mid-90s. Bojinka was a plot to hijack, uh, or excuse me, to, to blow up 12 airliners in midair as they were flying across the Atlantic to, to the United States uh, to kill the Pope, to kill President Clinton. But, you know, by 1998, certainly, even the New York field office was focused on, on Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda so much that KSM sort of fell by the wayside. And we also try to articulate in the book how the CIA, too, had a bin Laden station, but they were not focused on KSM because he wasn't considered to be al-Qaeda. Um, and the, the rendition unit that was chasing KSM or was in charge of, of his portfolio didn't have the analytical capabilities uh, that the bin Laden station did. Um, so there's, you know, there's many reasons why KSM was never caught. One of them is just that he himself is an extremely clever, uh, charismatic guy who had as many as 60 aliases and could travel uh, with a network of support that he built. I think one of the most important things that we talk about in the book is that um, KSM was instrumental in a lot of other things besides 9-11. He um, helped spearhead an underground railroad of sorts of al-Qaeda people from Afghanistan back into Pakistan right after 9-11. Uh, it was his connections with the jihadi underworld in Pakistan that really helped Al Qaeda regroup in Pakistan. Because, you know, as as most of you in this in this audience knows, um, you know, Bin Laden and many of his core uh, inner circle are are Saudis and Egyptians, and it's very hard for them to operate in a place like Pakistan where people speak Urdu. They're at the mercy of of their hosts, same as it was in Afghanistan. And so KSM was really a link between them and the Pakistani underworld militant groups like Jaishi Muhammad and Lashkar-e Taiba. And, and that was how they were able to survive after 9-11. Um, in fact, it was after KSM was captured that they went to the tribal areas uh, because, you know, in part because they just felt like the cities like Karachi were sort of too inhospitable to them at that point. So there's a lot of other, um, I actually wrote something that's maybe eight pages, but you don't want to hear all, all of this. I think the best information comes out during questions. But, you know, I think that a lot of the information in the book um, is character-driven. Um, there's a guy, Frank Pellegrino, who was an FBI agent, who I think when he thought that I was, um, when I was writing a book about this, I think that the people that I was focusing on in the FBI, and also to a lesser degree the CIA, thought that I was going to really um, drop the hammer on them and, and really ha have this be a book that, that criticized them sharply for what they did. But in reporting it, what we found was that the, the small group of people that were chasing these guys from 93 on really in, in some ways were true American heroes in the sense that they were trying to do everything they could to catch them. And they run, ran into obstacles uh, from within the FBI. They ran into obstacles from the CIA, certainly from the governments of Pakistan and Qatar who uh, weren't uh, very hospitable or helpful in their requests. Um, so there were a lot of reasons why they didn't catch them. Um, certainly mistakes were made. Leads weren't followed. Um, I know that these agents in particular um, have had many, many sleepless nights because they wonder <clears throat> which questions they should have asked that they didn't or who sh they should have talked to. So anyway, I hope you read the book. There's a lot of information in there that takes too long to explain now about the creative techniques they used. Um, they followed one guy, Jamal Khalifa, around literally for years in the mid-90s and, and were able to get a hotel room above and one below his, or an apartment complex, and listen to him for years just to see what he was saying. And I asked them, well, why were you following, following Jamal Khalifa, not KSM? And they said, well, that's because we didn't know where KSM was. I also said, well, Jamal Khalifa was Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law. How do you not know then that, that it's an al-Qaeda 
operation or that KSM is part of Al-Qaeda. And they have a very good answer for that, which would take too long to explain, but it's, but it's in the book. Part of it is that, you know, back then there were a lot of different operations um, that sort of different